So that's it. So okay, maybe we can start um, right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, maybe I'll just kick it off asking who is already using that, like ML in, in the work, uh, and then pass the floor to Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> so we can understand like who, who is familiar with the topic, who already using that, and who is completely like new and want to learn. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to hear um, what people are doing. Anybody want to chime in? Yeah, if, you, if you're not comfortable to speak, you can always use chat, for example, like just let, just give us some feedback. And I think it is also possible to just raise a hand. Uh, in uh, in a reaction that, for example, if anyone is using AI, AI ML from InterSystems at the moment, right? Yep. Yeah, so I see, uh, Mohammed, you've been very active uh, in the contests and programming um, things and, and just posting overall. I wondered uh, if you've had any uh, dipping your toes into doing any ML and what, what's interesting to you about this. I'll put you uh, on the spot. Yeah. Hi, all. Hi. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, I'm doing some study on this ML and AI tools. Uh, but uh, in for the inter-system tools, uh, I never used before, but uh, I'm planning to do this one. That's why I just joined this meeting. Great. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have a lot. Um, you know, we have our integrated ML, and we do have this PMML engine so you can use that anywhere and actually you can use pmml models in integrated ml uh, there's a way to just load a pmml model as a trained model uh, from a file so that we haven't really pushed that but it is there and so it would be interesting if you uh if you did work with pmml we could we could actually support that in the sequel yeah thanks Anyone else? Okay, I see stuff on nothing there. All right, no worries. I, I have a silly question. May I? Tom. Uh, so uh, the, our product is called Integrated ML. Uh, if if uh, Integrated ML is connected anyhow to uh, InterSystems integration tool, like to interoperability. Right. It's not directly. You'd oh. have to use it like any SQL operator. So you can use SQL, but it's yeah, it's not not fully integrated. There's there's things that could be done a lot easier if we if we developed like a particular business service or business operation that would that would invoke, you know, integrated ML, but it it is SQL, so it's you know, it's a little bit complicated, I think, to make something uh, I, really I easy see. to use. So, so can I say that uh, integrated ML is an intersystems extension of SQL to manage yes. uh, AI ML like in an auto ML, auto ML way? Okay, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a very, gotcha. very straightforward thing. And, and there's actually, you know, some tension there because here we're talking to the developer community. And we we want to develop things for developers. And so integrated ML should help developers that don't want to or can't do a whole bunch of specific ML stuff. They kind of have it right in the tools, right where the data is. And so that's a good thing, right? So that should enable a lot, um, using ML without uh, having a a whole data science team and a whole data science environment. But then it's very limited and it's very much a, a very small kind of toolkit with very circumscribed functionality. And that goes against what developers want because then developers want to get in and they want to change things and they want to mold it to whatever fit into their world. And there's, you can see there's some tension. So we try to make it easy to use, and that makes it not very developer friendly because you know we're not making a software development kit where you can make your own providers yet. We're thinking about that. We definitely want to do that. And that would 
kind of solve the problem where you'd have developers that really wanted to dig in and do more detailed work underneath. They need to like be able to see the Python that's running the ML, change it for their purposes. And that's a flexibility that that's kind of, you know, it's a big product difference when you're making just a very small toolkit versus making a software development kit. So that's, I'm way, I'm very much open to feedback on this and like what kinds of customization you'd want to do. Um, and, and we want to, we want to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe another, uh, like simple slash silly question about the AML with inter-system is, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, if I'm just need to move a needle with the AI and so do some job, so maybe I can start from integrated ML and really make uh, the SQL do the job for me. Uh, but also when I need like, when, okay, when I understand, oh, I'm a developer, I need to dive in, I need to go deeper and uh, customize everything. So then I take uh, Python or like embedded Python with Aris and I go this way. Yep. Right? Yeah. That would be, that would be a typical thing. Okay. It's much clearer. Yeah. And, and that should be more smooth. There should be, you know, ways, one thing that we don't, do that's on the roadmap as well. I'm just going to be in a full on apologizing for the problems mode here. <laughs> but one thing we don't do is uh, allow the models to be exported and then imported into another Iris instance, which is some kind of very developer thing you'd want to do uh, to have like different environments, dev, staging, prod, and just not have to retrain your models to do that. So that's that's definitely another way. So if you were able to kind of take that model around different irises and then access it from embedded Python, that would be a much more, you know, it could it is smooth the transition from the, you know, the beginner to the expert. But that's another thing of feedback, of like what exactly people want to do. It's been very early, like we don't have... A lot of customers really trying it and using it. I think our our customer base is not very, um, they're just not very far along in their ML journey. Mm -hmm. So, so it's- Okay, it's maybe, kind of maybe last front. question from me, Tom. Uh, um, sorry for my curiosity. Uh, just uh, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, I think, if I need embedded Python, so I can go with any uh, Iris uh, product image. I mean, so any, any, I can take any any image, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if I want uh, this extension of SQL, which is integrated ML, I, I think I need to uh, to consider a special build, right? Or it, or what what is that? My a special a special what? View? Special uh, container. Uh, like oh, Iris, well, uh... for all the community, it's 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 provided fully in the community editions. It, it's um, dedicated ML Docker image. Uh, Iris ML. Yes, Docker. yeah, it's a dash ML. It's different. It's add. a different image other than uh, just Iris uh, community. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's need it's some special image for if you want an extension of SQL that supports uh, integrated ML. Yes. So I need yeah, a yeah. special Thanks. distribution. Okay. So. Exactly. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. There's a there's a lot of um, libraries and things that we ship with it. That's part of it. It's just batteries included, and nothing else to install or even go to the internet to install things. Um, it just comes right inside of that that image and it's bigger. So we wanted to have different size containers for those that didn't want all of that extra bloat of the ML libraries. So that's the current mode. Okay, cool. So we had some other questions that people had brought up. Olga, should we switch to those or? Yes, we can we can switch if, if anyone like have particular questions. I don't know if you are looking for like steps, 
how to start and where you can try. I just wanted to mention that we do have Instruct demo, which is interactive environment ready-made. Uh, so I'm gonna put this link so you could try this right after this round table. And yeah, let us know your feedback. Uh, Thomas, if you have any other like how to start, because I see like people are uh, interested in the topic and sometimes just don't know, you know, there could be different places where people can start actually. And like, what is the best way to try it to, to make like hands on? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, finding data sets and, and, you know, working on a problem. I mean, a lot of things, there's just so much available on Kaggle and data sets pre-made. Um, and one of the things that really has tripped people up as we go to hackathons is they kind of come to integrated ML from not really even knowing C. And that's not how we typically, you know, have designed it. We think of it as more where developers, or SQL developers, or people that really know their data and know how to get to it and manipulate it with SQL, then want to do ML. Um, but a lot of people will come to to it with like kind of knowing a little bit about ML or knowing a lot about Python and not knowing anything about databases or SQL. So, you know, figuring out where you are on that spectrum. If you're definitely coming from knowing Python and and not knowing any SQL, it's going to be the first step is to get data into the database. And that's sometimes a challenge. So it's like you have to find a CSV file. You can't just load it right into the database. First, you've got to create the table and do the DDL. So you have to know what the data types are of that SQL. And, and of course, another apology, we don't have you know automatic inference. Now, there's a great community project called CSV Gen, a plug. I don't know. Let's see. I'll put it into the that does that does some inference and and will actually create your table make your create table syntax so that's something that that can be very useful to to get data into the database and then it should be pretty straightforward if it's like a data from a kaggle competition you can you know get the data into the same format that people are are doing for their machine learning and then just try it where you're going to you know, have one table of data, as long as you can get it into one view, you might have to do a join or create a view. Um, and once you do that, you can train a model, build a model. And I can, I can show through our, 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 um, Tom, our, Tom, um, uh, I think yep. it's worth, worth to add that this region is kind of like it's inter-systems way uh, of how to load data. Mm -hmm. But if we think about Pythonish way, so in this case, it's a, like a huge amount of uh, open source tools or any tools. Like uh, Pandas, uh, it's a data science tool uh, which can help with it as well. Or True. DBT, DBT. Uh, I found it also very cool. Uh, with CSV, even without schema, it uh, can create a table for, for you yep. just uh, Basically. And then just save it to the database. Yes. And DBT now supports Iris, so we can do it also. So yeah, you should uh, you should more post... and more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there is definitely more options now that we have these uh, the DB API drivers. DBT is a new thing. You want to post the um, the link to your DBT. Um, the repository. I, I, oh, we we need to, to write uh, some uh, article about using it. I I, can, I, I, don't, I don't know what to write. Uh, as a, I I I am DBT user from developer uh, DBT developer uh, site. I have no idea yet how to use DBT as a project site. Yeah, so, yeah, it's it's definitely it's a completely different. Uh, case yeah it is it is different so if anyone's curious there's that get dbt.com now dbt is the t in elt so it just does the transforms and it's mostly just sql they've added some python things and we're looking at that but we've 
Dimitri has helped develop a, an adapter for Iris so that you can use DBT, which is really just a kind of a SQL templating engine, a workflow pipeline kind of uh, formatting for SQL, and really just makes it a lot easier to, to manage a SQL pipeline and do it like code. So it's like bringing analytics engineering or data engineering more into the developer kind of framework of CI, CD, and just developing and validating your models using using command line tools and get and important part like it, repo. it supports hmm? uh, important part it supports also migration uh, of data so you can change uh, columns uh, from time to time so it's a, it's equal as a code and you can change your columns and so on but dbt will take care about all these changes in database itself from SQL. So yeah, will, that is an awesome thing. And it and it keeps track of your lineage. So it can act as like a data catalog as well. So you it'll draw the diagram of your pipeline and what tables and what artifacts mean what so you can really track what you're doing. So it's definitely a nice tool. And we'd love to get customers and course community members using it just try it out so we have a put a little bit of work into making a nice adapter so so that's another way that uh, people can kind of get started using machine learning because dbt helps you kind of do that data engineer to to take multiple tables and maybe make one kind of big table or big view and it has a lot of options on how you create those views but it's not super uh, beginner friendly. I think there's quite a bit of learning to, to do to get really good at it. So like anything, but it, it, but it could be fun. I would encourage. So I don't know where that was. Did we? Um... Yeah, so that was that was kind of talking about getting started. And I was talking about getting data in and, and there's there's definitely a great way to use use the SQL Alchemy and the DB API drivers to to get data into the database that makes it easier. Okay. Thanks, uh, Tom. May, may may I ask another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so, as far as I understand, uh, um, Integrator Mail is a like extension for SQL, right? And um, and uh, I know that we recently inter launched another uh, like a SQL extension, which is like a, a Fire SQL Builder, right? Yes. Yes. And so my question is, can I maybe use uh, Integrated ML to SQL versus uh, or against the Fire SQL? Like, uh, that... So if I have a SQL access to fire data maybe i can also uh craft some and make some ai around that yeah that is absolutely the idea um and we haven't really proven that so fire sql builder is just getting kind of integrated into our kits it's a experimental feature in the latest uh 23.1 upcoming release um but so Fire SQL Builder is a is just kind of a new toolkit that's on top of Iris and allows you to take, you know, if you're using Iris and Iris for Health in particular as a fire repository where you're actually storing fire data, which is really kind of like um, a document model, really. I mean, the way that it's all structured is that there's big entities like patient and encounter. And those are kind of documents that, that get linked by different um, you know, identifiers. Um, but then what you need to do is if you want to do analytics on it, it's much better and much easier and much more compliant with the rest of kind of analytics world to have it 
shown to you as SQL tables. But the FIRE data model is, it's like a document, but it's, it's kind of a graph. And so going from a graph to a table structure requires some choices how you're going to flatten, how you're going to, you know, turn it into tables. And the Fire SQL Builder walks you through that process and gives you all those options kind of in an easy toolkit way. So what you do with Fire SQL Builder is, well, first it analyzes your Fire repo and shows you what data elements are there. Then you choose some of those elements and make choices about how they get translated into tables. And then it generates the definitions for those tables, but it doesn't move the data. It just uses the iris projection. It uses the globals underneath and projects them as SQL. So you're not doing ETL. You can imagine if you're making a very big repository of, of patient data, it could get you know billions of records or whatnot, right? For people, uh, you don't wanna copy that data. So with Fire SQL Builder, you're able to to generate the table view without actually moving data. So it's very efficient that way and it will be very unique in the market. So of course, once you have tables, you could do integrated ML, but then there, what we're thinking is that for most use cases, you're going to have to have multiple tables and do joins and then it'll be ready for integrated ML because then you have a single view um, with encounter data, patient demographic data, laboratory data. Those are big kinds of uh, chunks of data that you need to join together to then do some machine learning over, over a patient's data. So we're, we're in the process of like making a, a demo that, that goes through that whole process with some realistic looking data. Um, but you know, totally encourage the community to just jump right in and 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 play with it, because uh, we'll have that capability very uh, very soon here. Uh, do I have a question? This is Sundara from Intersystems Dubai. Yeah. Uh, we hold a lot of uh, patient data in terabytes. Okay. So as you said, uh, it's a SQL projection and kind of view. Okay. So is it a, a in-memory processing on call or how it is? Unlimited processing? Excuse me, I'm is, sorry. No, is, is it in-memory processing? Like um, it, on call, it will be processed and the results will be delivered or how it is kind of? You said uh, it is kind of view, right? For, 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 are you talking about the Fire SQL Builder? Yeah, or the ML. Excluded oh yeah, ML. well, yeah, I think so. So, so, so the way integrated, I'll just talk about how integrated ML does it. Um, is that underneath we're typically calling Python, it might be Java in the case of uh, H2O provider, or we also have an engine that will uh, use data robot underneath. In all those cases, you get the data that you're training um, as in memory typically is in memory. Uh, we do have an option with, you know, to, to, to just do it streaming wise to H2O, but we haven't really used that yet underneath. We haven't really had to. Most of the things that we're doing kind of fit in memory um, mostly. But if you have something that just doesn't and it's not working well, I would like to know because it, there's definitely options of how to do that streaming underneath. So in this case, most of our customers, they have their uh, data in huge. For example, if you take a patient data, it will be in, uh, even for a day or a month, it will be in many gigabytes. Yep. Right? So uh, the performance will be affected, is it? Depends on the size of the data. Yeah, I mean, you, you, there's only so much you can do with whatever you know, machine you have. If it's not big enough, you, you know, you're going to have to split it or just train on, you know, a particular subset of data to start with um, and figuring out typically. OK, so so one of the tricks that we learned, I mean, it's kind of a trick from data robot is that over 
all of their clients. They have a limit of like five gigabytes for their ML. And they didn't come across any problems that needed more than that. And the reason is, is because you start with all the columns and very few rows, whatever fits in memory. And you figure out, and that's typically enough to figure out which columns actually matter. You cut down the number of columns in half, and then you can add more rows from your historical store. And then you can do that again. And eventually you'll get to like all of the examples, but you're only using the columns that you need. So that, I mean, we don't do that automatically, but that's kind of the process that data robot would always use. So even if there was like a lot of data, they didn't ever absolutely need to do machine learning on all that data. And this is auto ML, it's tabular data. So that's definitely not like images. You know, it's not like we're going over all the radiology images. That's definitely a different, can be a different scale and can be, you know, challenging for, for that type of thing. But that's not really the problem set we're going after. It's not a completely general ML solution. It's it's really kind of for tabular data and and typically something that that nowadays five gigabytes is not that big a deal, even in RAM. So so I encourage you to try to break it. Uh, no, <clears throat> what I'm thinking is actually I uh, was in a plan to prepare uh, uh, patients. Uh, this is prediction. So with the history of past 30 years of data, uh, you can uh, provide the data to the AML so that it can uh, predict uh, in this climate or in this period, uh, these certain people might affect with this particular disease. Mm -hmm. okay. For yep. this, I need to supply a terabyte of data. Okay, yep. so that's why. Uh, will will the system support or? Uh, not... Like I said, it's it's gonna it's gonna support you know up to a few gigabytes in RAM, as many, as much RAM as you need, and and then and then it's going to the the limiting factors is going to be training time. So we're not, you know, we don't have, um, you know, if you're going to do those kind of things, you're really going to get, for like a very large number of patients, you're going to need like a cluster or, or you're going to need a very big instance and you're going to want to use all the cores for training. Um, yeah, it's, it's, like I said, we're not going after that right out of the box you, you you if you're going for something huge like that you're going to want to do something custom anyways but i think that there's a lot of power in using dbt things like that to actually you need to kind of collect your data you got to organize your data you have to really know what those patients are you've got to dig into the data quality and and that's that's a bigger part of the problem than than just the sheer size of it and one more thing, uh, you said uh, you will be involving Python and uh, other technologies, correct? Yes, it uses Python underneath. So, which is out of out of our uh, inter inter-systems uh, technology, correct? You will be using some uh, connectivity interfaces to interact, or it's uh, inbuilt uh, compilers or something. Um, I'm not sure exactly where. I so, so we have embedded Python that, that we use uh, underneath for kind of transferring between our SQL engine and the Python libraries that we use, at least for our default provider. And it's really just using our embedded Python, which is kind of in process, in memory kind of connection to so this, mean, environment. so this means you will be having only the libraries and the compilers will be outside the environment. Right? It's not part of Um same, same like calling Java uh, ODBC or something like that. The Python compiler will be outside and it will be processed using the libraries. With the yeah, library. I mean, it, it, it has to be kind of outside because it's, it's not C++, but we have a very tight connection 
between mm -hmm. our object script and the Python environment. We're actually kind of specifying the Python environment. Okay. Someone uh, maybe mute. There's a lot of background noise. Someone's having a good time. Anyways, yeah. So I I I think I'd have to understand a little bit more where your questions are coming from to, to kind of uh, answer. But um, but yeah, it's uh, the compilers. Are you talking about compilers for? I just want to dig in a little bit. Are you talking about the compilers for Python or compilers for what? No, for example, we are using the reports. Okay, some of the reports contact uh, Java machines. Yeah. JVM. Okay. Similarly, uh, this integrated MLs, they contact the external resources or it runs within Iris itself. Oh, right. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's external. Yeah. Yeah. The reason why I asked this, uh, for example, uh, in the case of database, when you insert or update, it is uh, easy. But when you prepare a report, and if it depends external JVM or any other resources, it's very you know costly calls. So similarly, when I process a huge transactions using ML, it should not you know uh, affect my current servers or current system. That's the reason. Yeah, I yeah. I mean, this is going to use the same machine, right? And and actually, there's uh, but but the Python is running kind of in, in the same process as Iris. And and we use kind of memory transfer, so the, the overhead is not bad. So okay. kind of shared memory. So, um, but yeah, there's always gonna be issues moving data. And, and to some extent, data is moving from our Iris C memory space to the Python memory space. So there is some transfer there. Okay. Yep, it's a, it's a, it's very important to understand where things are getting done. <laughs> uh, so Tom, uh, you say that uh, the train uh, train component like train call from integrated ML is a. Uh, Pretty uh, computation intensive, right? So, uh, from this uh, is my question: uh, whether it is good uh, practice to use uh, integrated ML on the machine that is like OLTP uh, server, or should it be on like some on standalone analytics server that nobody is using other than for AI stuff? And so, what is the uh, or maybe it's okay to do train and train on the side and then uh, predict could be run, run on a machine that is that has a heavy transaction load what's what's the best practice yeah so i think so um if you if you have a separate machine that's better right to you know or just to if it, if there if you've got something running really fast that's an oltp uh setup you probably don't want to mess with that machine. But what you can do with Iris, of course, is set up uh, another Iris that's an asynchronous reporting mirror or an ECP node. And you can do the training on that. Um, and then the, the model will just be central and, and you'll be able to use the model then against the SQL, uh, at least in the ECP case. If you have an, an asynchronous reporting mirror, you do the training, you're going to do the predict there also. It's going to be a separate SQL endpoint. But it but the data will look the same, and your application would just kind of hit a different endpoint for for the ML prediction than it would for the, the transactions, perhaps. But since it's all kind of synchronized, it just depends on, on what you want to do. So there, there's some some options there, but we haven't had a lot of, I mean, I've used the asynchronous reporting setup, but I haven't used ECP yet really to try to do anything substantial. So be interesting to see someone try that. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, may I ask one question, please? Yes. Yeah, actually, the machine learning, there are a lot of models, you know, and uh, uh, just I saw the example. Uh, we are, looks like we are using a simple regression. Uh, is, are we are also, what up to what extent we are also using other models like deep learning or uh, clustering, these kind of things? Are we supporting these as well? Yeah, not necessarily the clustering. Okay, so clustering is typically like this unsupervised learning and we don't have that. We just do classification and regression. So for regression though, um, we use logistic regression um, as one of the, the models. Um, there's also, we'll also train. So I'm talking about our um, default auto ML pipeline that's, that's, that's written in Python. And so it'll use for regression, you know, logistic regression, and also we'll try a TensorFlow uh, deep neural network, but not very deep. Just tries pretty much as a straightforward one, one layer or two layer, um, can't remember which, um, network. Um, and then for classification, we do XGBoost. Um, and so, so those are the, the typical kinds of um, algorithms we're using. Okay, and normally when we are we are training the model and after that we are evaluating the model to check the accuracy and after that we are tuning the models. So do we have all these tools already so, available? So we have a validate command that runs some metrics. It runs the really top metrics. Um, and if you wanna do more sophisticated things, it was just writing someone, you, you'll pull the data out um, from SQL, of course, using like a notebook, whatnot. You could do the predictions and you can calculate the true positives, false positives, and calculate whatever metric you want just using uh, the data you get from SQL, like anything. Okay, do we do we have any visualization, uh, visualization tool to see all these details? It's all SQL, so there's no visualization. Are we planning to do this? Because this will be really helpful to visualize the data. Yeah, I think most of what we're, uh, I mean, so so that's kind of like out, that's that's one of these tensions between like, you know, having an all SQL toolkit and then, and then having some kind of, you know, user interface to it. Uh, you have to develop then two things. And we, we haven't really focused on visualization yet, but um, what we are doing is adding stuff to our cloud service. And then that might be something that eventually gets rolled out to all of our kind of um, clients. But we just want to develop something like an integrated notebook within our cloud service solution and maybe have some visualization that way. But um, I think, I think uh, so visualization, if it's just, uh, this result is a plain SQL, it's a plain SQL result. So any uh, visualizer which uh, supports uh, SQL uh, good enough. Uh, so, uh, actually, I uh, recently discovered uh, Apache Superset uh, project, which uh, yes. was working uh, with DB API and I looking into check on support on it so maybe i'll manage uh, uh, to add this uh, as support I, as well yeah i added an i added an issue to superset to add iris you might you might see that somewhere <laughs> on the superset site but i haven't i haven't uh i haven't followed up on that i think that is something that just needs to be developed but they they use db api and i think that we should be able to do that very easily yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just yeah. That... Time to implement it. And it yeah, be... I might pay you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> <'Cause> that's good. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> because that's a really cool uh, visualization framework. And yep. you know, Mohammed, you can use Jupyter notebooks. You can attach to the, uh, you know, to the to your iris and and get to all that data and use use a lot of things from from the Jupiter kind of ecosystem and matplotlib and things like that. Yep. But yes, visualization is it's it's really that whole thing of actually being able to do machine learning requires that. 
in some way. It requires a lot of pieces to really do the whole thing. And we're really providing just a very kind of small toolkit that, that should help mostly with the deployment. Like when you're actually using it, you train a model, it's deployed. You don't go through this whole back and forth. So it should be kind of quick from that perspective, but you need to kind of augment it with, you know, your notebooks or, you know, other things to where you calculate the metrics you really want to and get deep into the data. Um, so it's not just a black box all in one type of thing. It's just a black box, small piece of it, <laughs> but a very critical piece and, and very useful. So, but again, I'm on the apology tour. And while we don't have this uh, Apache superset, just want to remind you that we have uh, some internal tools like Iris BI. And it's uh, for some very simple uh, uh, tasks uh, to visualize something that you can do it in a few clicks, even with Iris BI and have some good visualization with some community tools like Gypsy Web. Yeah, and there was and, a there was, uh, there's a community uh, article about uh, integrating integrated ML predictions into your deep C cube. So there's a very little bit of kind of object script that you can write that that can then show those predictions right along with the um, right along with your 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 deep C data. So that's a really um, that's a really interesting kind of connection that you can make doing deep sea stuff along with integrated ml and i i encourage you to look mm -hmm. for that i should find the link to that article i think it was might have been yuri marks that did that or yeah like and that. and of course and if you have happened to have a, a advanced server of iris so you have adaptive analytics and uh, so this means that at scale server like all the adaptive analytics is in your hand and so you could uh, get a face of Power BI and Tableau to your uh, data to just to like also to visualize to visualize it. Okay. Yeah, so we've actually and it, and it's also dead simple to use integrated ML with adaptive analytics. You can make a calculated column that just calls predict and then it just dynamically automatically um, calls that when it needs to and then you can integrate those Tableau reports. So that's pretty slick as well. So that's kind of the, cool. the power of having all SQL, just you know, adding some SQL statements, then tools like adaptive analytics just work. Um, so that's been nice to see. Yeah, and I think that was one of the questions also was that difference between deep sea and integrated ML, I mean, they're just totally different because deep C is a business intelligence kind of modeling environment as well. Like you, you have to define your aggregations, your dimensions, you're building up this kind of cube view of your business for analytics. Integrated ML is just machine learning. It's, you know, off in its own world. It's really not connected uh, to deep C or BI, but as we said, there's a ways to, to put them together a little bit of object script or just using adaptive analytics. And so that'll be something we'll be working on more in the future too. So yeah, I was just going, I don't know if I should show our cloud service. Could go through that. Um, were there any other questions, or should I just try to pop into our cloud service and show you what we're working on there? I guess I'll just do that until someone stops me. If you have huh? some demo, I think everyone will appreciate. Yeah, I'll just show uh, what we've been showing at hackathons. Um, so really, what we've been doing is um, providing hackathon participants with this cloud service. And I can actually, I mean, we're going to kind of run through it. I don't know if we'll get all the way through a training run, but the way that the cloud service um, is set up is that you, you, you have deployments 
I've already created one here. Deployment is an instance of Iris. And we're going to have a lot of different options, but the option that's most relevant to this discussion is just having Cloud SQL, which is you know just providing SQL capabilities in a service, kind of a fully managed Iris service. And then you additionally click Integrated ML, you choose what size, we kind of have this as T-shirt sizes, many cores and RAM, um, of course, large is better, Small can still handle things. Uh, it's just not as fast. And then you choose whether you can connect to it, uh, whether it'll allow unencrypted connections. You set a password that's pretty much the SQL admin or SQL user password uh, that, that you'll use to connect to the database. And then once you create it, which I won't go through that whole creation thing, um, you get to an actual instance and here you can see everything about it um you know we have the ram there and then the credentials choose to um, connect to it what port so you can use that with any of the tools and then you have a, a bunch of things you can do here once you have a deployment so one thing is to add files and kind of manage files upload them we have some um you know some some example data from um, from taxi data from New York. And uh, sorry, <laughs> very important message. Um, so then <clears throat> so then you want to import those files and I'll start with that process. This is one way to do it. Of course, you can connect with the notebook, um, go through a nice little wizard, tell what kind of DDL it is. And of course, this is the SQL that we have. And then I just import that. And then that SQL runs, which is like create table. And then, oops. Then you actually have to import the CSV data. Like a training file, we'll just say, yep. We already had the DDL created. And we we'll say it has a header. And I think that's it. So we have that, and then we'll import another the validation data. So we've split up this data into actually two kind of subsets, which makes it easier. Okay, so those should be done. And then when you go, you can like query the data and you can see what's here. Uh, we'll also show the information schema for the different subset things for integrated ML, the trained models, training runs. And here you can see this actual, all the columns from this data that we imported. And so you can just do a, And just have a simple kind of viewer, the table. But then we have like this whole other section that just walks you through the integrated ML parts, like creating a model, training a model, and then validating it. So you just kind of say taxi tip, and we're gonna train it on this training table. Oh, I guess I can't use an underscore. Huh, I don't think that's quite right. All right, and so then you just choose which field you're predicting on. This is the auto ML. You've got all the data in one table, and now you choose which one. And we're gonna do tip amount, I believe. There we go. So you can then create a model, just have a nice point and click. And then once it's created, you can train it. Of course, we have a drop down to choose which one don't really have to select or make a trained model name, but that helps sometimes when you're organizing different models. And then you just hit train. I don't know how long this is gonna take. It might take a few minutes, but um, we'll see. So here then it pops up and you can kind of keep track of the training run and see the log file. Now, the SQL, the, the cloud service that we have just uses the H2O provider. 
Um, for now, we're going to add different providers, but the H2O provider, you know, it uses XG Boost. It uses a lot of different, has a lot of different models um, that it tries. And it has a, a, a really nice kind of algorithm underneath and, and it's a totally open source um, auto ML provider. It's really, really nice. So you can pass in different uh, customizing options to H2O. Shoot. So let's see. Yeah, I don't know. It's definitely not done yet, but it should be done pretty soon. So, see i'm hoping that does complete maybe maybe while we're waiting for it to train which i of course wanted to do this before well i'm gonna have to drop here in a couple couple minutes oh, so there it completed okay and then you can actually see all the output and this shows you know it's 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 not very well formatted but you can actually see some of the all of the models that are on the leaderboard so that H2O does a lot of ensembling and stacked ensemble models and these uh, G-Boost models. So they have a very, very nice system underneath. So now that you've got that trained, you can actually do the validate and get your metrics. Ooh, it's not showing up. I guess we need to refresh because now it's been trained. Yes, so now we have a trained model. We'll validate it on this validation and boom. And then also you see that there's like some edit SQL uh, commands. So you can override some of these things. Of course, the log file for validation, oops, shows, you know, it goes really quickly. So that's that's that. And then, then we can generate some SQL to predict and which we'll kind of walk you through that type of thing. So then you can edit that SQL and actually run it and get your predictions. There you see, I think at the end of this, let's see, where is it? Select top 100 predict. So the first thing is the predict. Is that true? As prediction. There, hmm. maybe I had the old things there. So there you go, there you can see the prediction and work on that. So it's kind of a nice way. We actually also have like an orientation gonna, that'll really kind of walks you through that example uh, because those um, those files are, 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 are kind of preloaded into our system. Anyway, so that's uh, that was what I was gonna show. We're gonna do more in that. Um, with our cloud service. And like I said, probably add some visualization tools there first. Okay, all right. Well, let's see, I wanted to see. Ah, yes, yeah. so we have the show validation metrics as well. So Mohammed, we do have a little bit, we have like a, a chart where we're giving. So that just kind of shows you the prediction versus actual. That's the extent of our uh, visualization at this point. Yeah, that, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I have to run. I've got another meeting. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys. And obviously, send me email, message, whatever, anytime. I'm totally open and want to help people use this no matter what they're doing. So really appreciate the time. Thank you, Thomas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Send us your questions if you still have any, like in Discord, in Global Masters, and developer community, and we are going to publish this around yes. the world. Yeah, I'll, I'll be checking those. But but uh, Olga, if you see anything for me, please make sure, sure. I make sure I get to it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good day. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank Absolutely. you. Thanks, Olga. Thank you.